for mental health counseling. Uh, she's got 19 years of experience, and she's also a USA field hockey coach. So they bring a, a lot of experience in the mental health uh, uh, wheelhouse and with athletics. So thank you all for coming. Good morning. We're gonna take a little pivot here. Technology is not my wheelhouse. It actually causes mental health issues. <laughs> All right. So today is going to be about um, how do we maintain our mental, emotional, and physical health so we can be the best version of ourselves for the student athlete, for our coworkers, for our families, and most importantly, for ourselves. Um, I'm gonna kind of give a rough outline and then Dr. Lohr will follow up with some skills and a toolbox that you can take with you today. Um, we are going to kind of go at this from burnout, balance, and boundaries. Without boundaries, we are gonna struggle with balance in our life and without balance, we could have burnout. So what is burnout? Well, first off, this is no new topic for athletic trainers having burnout and retention concerns. Um, they've been studying it. At, back in 2013, they were studying this already for 20 years. 70% um, of the factors for athletic trainers leaving the profession were burnout, employment factors, personal pa factors, and personal fit. That's gonna be our personal trait, right? Like our personality assessment. Um, suggested causes for athletic trainers leaving was, um, or suggested, sorry, suggested reasons for burnout were work-life conflict. Y'all work very long hours, not a lot of time at home, and also uh, organizational factors, poor salary, long hours, and difficulty dealing with the politics of, the athletic, of athletics. So what does burnout do to us? Well, it affects us mentally, physically, and emotionally. Um, according, uh, what is burnout? Uh, burnout is mental, phys mental, emotional, and physical exhaustion. It decreases our motivation, which lowers our performance which I don't know about you, but when I'm not performing 100%, I feel really bad about myself. I'm not giving 100% to anything. Um, so some other causes of burnout besides just at work is when uh, our personality trait doesn't match up or individual factors that are happening outside of the work for, workplace. The effects of burnout can be changes in sleep pattern. None of these are, none of these mean you're burnt out if you have like one or two of them. 
It's like an accumulation of them, right? So if you're exhausted and tired, but you're having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, kind of a red flag. Um, if you are feeling, um, you're having changes in your appetite, you're feeling nausea quite frequently, problems with your bowel system, headaches, you're getting sick more frequently, your blood pressure is very high, um, uh, and, and it can cause some heart disease also. Um, if you're finding that you're more irritable or angry, when you are giving 100%, which I know you guys are working nonstop and you're giving 100%, and sometimes those student athletes like don't come in for treatment when they're supposed to, um, we can be, get really angry. We're not, it's not reciprocated. We're giving a lot and they're not reciprocating that. So we might see some irritability, anger towards coworkers, family, students, um, increased sadness, feeling unsure about your job, cynical, not satisfied with your, with your accomplishments. When we start to see only the negative stuff and we can't see the good stuff that we're doing, red flag. Um, if we are misusing food, drugs, and alcohol to cope or numb out completely. I actually coached at St. Mary's Hall for seven years, and I will say, um, full disclosure, uh, one of the many reasons I walked away is because I would come home and I would immediately pour a drink. That was how I, I that was the only way I could chill out. And I was like, man, I don't want this to be, I don't want my kids to see this and be like, that's normal and normalize that. So that was definitely um, something that I had to um, take a hard look at. So possible causes for um, burnout. Lack of control. Oh my gosh, you guys have not a lot of control over a lot of things in your profession. All right, you are working with numerous coaches, all the student athletes. You cannot control when they practice, when they schedule practices, when they schedule games. You can't control how many kids get injured. You can't control if they come in for treatment, if the parents listen to you or take your referrals or if they go to their own places. It seems like a lot could be out of your control, right? So that lack of control can cause burnout. Um, unclear job expectations, right? If we are unclear of what our AD expects of us, if we are unclear of what the coach's expectations are, and not that we have to do everything that the coaches tell us to do, but just being aware of it. Um, la so a lack of communication, basically, if there's a lack of communication. Um, dysfunctional work dynamics. Are you feeling undermined by parents, by the students, by the coaching staff? Um, Extreme activity. Obviously, this is a go, 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 go profession, right? So you are constantly on your feet going, which means you are going to be exhausted and tired, right? So that's already a vulnerability that you're going to have. Lack of support. Are you being included in your athletic department meetings? Are you supported by your AD? Um, that could be a cause if you have a lack of support. And then work-life balance, this is a big one, and this is what we're really going to talk a lot about today, is um, are you, do you have time for yourself, for the things that you enjoy, and do you have time for your families? Or, if you're single, do you have time to mingle? All right, so how do we find balance? Well, first is self-awareness. Um, know how you rejuvenate, not rest. We can all take naps. How do you fill your cup? What do you do for yourself? Um, know if you're an introvert or an extrovert, right? Introverts need a little bit more alone time. So understand if you need that and where can you fit that in your day? Um, I have all my students, uh, I do teach a wellness class and we um, do a lot of uh, dialectical behavioral skill work and how to cope with things and um, so I have all the kids start the year with doing their personality assessments. Um, we normally do Enneagrams or 16 personalities. Dr. Lohr is going to introduce you to some others. But um, 
it really does, the kids will identify that, oh, so it, my personality trait, I might struggle with socialization because I like to be alone, but I really value friendship. So what skills are you gonna need so that you can build friendships even though that's not part of your personality trait, right? So understanding what your personality traits are. If you're not a go, go, go person and you need that downtime, somehow you're gonna have to fit that into your day. Um, I then have the kiddos uh, write down their beliefs and their values. The way, to, the way I have them get to their values is I ask them, identify one person you admire and make a list of the things you admire about that person. Those are probably things that you value. Maybe you're not pursuing those right this moment, but there's something that you want to pursue. So once you have your values and your beliefs, add in some interests. What are your interests? You like to go fishing, hiking, reading, yoga? What are your interests? Do you make time for those things? And then lastly, I will have them to figure out what we want to set boundaries for. I have them figure out what are your priorities. And I break those into work, family, which can also be friends, and personal. And basically, I ask them to think about it as like if you drop a rock in the water, there's a ripple effect. That inner circle, those are your number one priorities. And I have them write out their priorities. And you can get really intricate, like it's more important for me to treat my athlete first and then deal with the parent. Or maybe it's more important for me to deal with the parent first. You can break it down very intricate or you can be more broad. Um, so those priorities also are going to include self-care. Like I want to have a sleep routine. I want to get enough rest. I want to make sure I'm eating right. I want to spend time with my kids or my significant other or my friends. So you break that down and your most important are in the middle. And remember that when you are saying yes to the outer circles, you are essentially saying no to those main priorities that are most important to you, that you value the most. And that can cause internal conflict. So now, we are, now we've kind of figured out what we want in our life, what our priorities are. And remember that work-life balance is going to look different for everybody. If you're single, if you have kids, if you have young kids versus older kids, if you have a significant other, if you don't, it's going to look very different what your priorities are. So now that you've identified your priorities, what do you need to make time for? And what boundaries do you need to set? All right, so we understand why we're setting boundaries so we can have a balanced life. And we've done the priorities and the values. So now we're gonna come up with our work boundaries. All right, so I'm gonna throw out some very um, broad work boundaries that you might look at me and be like, girl, you don't even know what you're talking about. There's no way I can set those boundaries at my job. That's fine, because we'll go into how to really figure out what boundaries you can set within your system, but these are just very broad. So you have a bunch of coaches, there every, four teams are having Saturday practice, a good work boundary. Hey, I will be there from seven to one. If you wanna practice, practice from seven to one. If you wanna have a practice after that, I probably won't be there. All right, that could be a work boundary that you might wanna set. Um, incorporating self-care in your day could be a boundary. It could look like a lot of teams are going, I know our football team at our school went to um, football practices in the mornings and then they have volleyball after school. So now the athletic trainer is there from four in the morning till seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night, right? So maybe it looks like, hey, I'm gonna step away for three hours in the middle of the day. I'm gonna go get a workout in or I'm gonna go have lunch with a friend. Um, again, these are very broad, and you obviously have to know, have a good relationship with your AD, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, turn off your phones when you leave work. That's a good boundary we could all use. Um, so when you leave, obviously, if you have an injured athlete, there, something happened, they're in a hospital, or they went to get x-rays, you gotta answer the phone. But that should be, the, um, I just went blank, uh, that should be the rare 
that you do that. And once you set the boundary that I'm not going to answer the phone in the evenings, try to stick to it. Because the minute you answer that phone, every parent's calling you, right? Um, maybe a boundary for work would be, I'm not going to check emails in the evening. I will get back to you in the morning. Um, family boundaries. Hey, take your vacation time. You all get it. Take it. I'm going to take my family on a vacation. I like to, every time we have a three-day weekend, I like to try to plan something on a three-day weekend. So making a family plan that that's something you want to do. Um, also family boundaries. When I get home, I work at the same place my kids go to school. So I sit in 45 minutes of traffic with my children, and I've been with kids all day long. So guess what? When mommy gets home, I don't have an answer for you. For one hour, I get to be by myself. So that's a boundary I set with my family. Um, and then personal boundaries. That might look like I want to have a sleep routine, so starting at a certain time, I'm going to get ready and do some self-care stuff for myself um, or for yourself. It could also look like um, morning routines. I'm going to get up and go for a walk or exercise that you want to incorporate in your day. I think I missed a whole, oh no, I didn't, I'm good. All right, so how do we set these boundaries? So you're all looking at me, and you're probably laughing like you have no idea what you're talking about because we work 100 plus hours a week. So where do we fit all this fun extra time that you're talking about? Well, I think the first steps are to know your school's beliefs and know your school's values, right? So if you work at a school that is pushing for wellness and pushing for family time and they value that, you probably have a better chance of them listening to your boundaries. If you don't, it's probably going to be a little bit more difficult. So knowing that about your system that you work in. Um, know your clientele. Do you have parents who, are, who expect you to answer them in two seconds, right? Um, I work at a private school, and they expect you to answer them in two seconds. So kind of know your clientele. Know the resources you have available to you. Do you have access to a contract trainer? Can they cover you? If you, are, if you have a, a weekend tournament, could they cover you for a day during the week so you could be off? Can they cover you for vacation time? Know if you have that available to you. Uh, know your AD's expectations. What, is, what do they expect of you? And then I think the biggest thing is know your contract. Know what hours it says on there. Know exactly what the expectations of your workload is. Um, and then at that point, you can start working within your system and kind of thinking outside of the box and getting creative with how you could get time off or make time within your day to self-care. Communicating boundaries up front is super important. It is very difficult, I'm sure you guys know this, to backtrack and try to, you've been doing it this way and it's not working and now I'm gonna try to go back and change it all. That is very difficult to do and it's very difficult to get people to jump on board with that change. So try to communicate up front at the beginning of the year in writing. Um, preferably get your, talk to your athletic director, get him on board, that first coaches meeting, Try to set those boundaries up front and expectations. Um, communicate your needs to your family. And no is an answer. Learn to say no. It's very hard to do. I'm not very good at it myself. But um, learn to say no. Because they will keep asking if you keep saying yes. They will keep asking. So some takeaways before we get to some of the toolbox is um, hopefully self-awareness. Good communication is key for setting boundaries. Um, evaluate your options. Know what all your options are. Know what you have control over and what you don't. Self-care, developing healthy habits. This is going to be with boundaries and balance. Seek support when needed, coworkers, friends, loved ones, and know if your school offers mental health. Um, I know we offer a counseling service to our employees if needed. And then practice the pause. This is my favorite. 
I like to think of this as um, learning to be responsive instead of reactive, right? You work in a very reactive field where you have to like make decisions really quickly when a student athlete gets injured. And when you're dealing with conflict, when you're dealing with parents who are freaking out, really learn to practice that pause. That may mean I will return your email tomorrow. Let's talk about this situation tomorrow so you can sit on it for a second. Take a beat. All right, Dr. Lohr, thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Valerie Lore. Tiffany, excellent job. I appreciate you so much. I get to work with her every day and Phil, who doesn't want me to call him out, but I work for him every day too, Phil. Um, just putting you on the spot. Uh, so I work at St. Mary's Hall. Um, I've been here for two years and first and foremost, thank all of you very, very much. My first interaction with a trainer was, I was a dual sport athlete at Division I University and regularly injured. And I think I drove Jen crazy on a daily basis. So wherever you are in this world, Jen, thank you for not, you know, sending me away and always working with me. Um, a little bit about my journey of why I think it's so important to focus on your mental health, your modeling, giving you actual practical toolkits because I know you're really, really busy. Like how many of you right now can raise your hand and say your only sole job is to treat physical injury? I'm shocked, okay. Let's try another one. How many of you feel a responsibility to treat your athletes as a whole person? And sometimes you can get in the weeds on that and you're like, I don't know, like this is way above my pay grade, COVID happened, now I'm running a response team, now I'm here 24 seven, I'm delivering meals to kids and I'm just, I don't know what to do to help these folks help themselves. And I can say as a coach myself and at the collegiate level, there was plenty of times that I went to trainers and I was like, can you treat me? I'm sorry. So just adding more and more to your plate and I was never told no because of how generous your spirit is. You wouldn't be in this job for the money, that's for sure, or for the hours or for the perks. So huge thank you to all of you. Um, and I've started focusing on mental health at my third coaching position and really getting into it because I had to dismiss a student athlete from the field during practice. And I'm pretty easygoing that I'm like, hey, I have automatic amnesia and I'm not sure if you run your training rooms the same way where you're like, you can have a bad day, you didn't show up, you didn't do the exercises, you didn't do what I asked you to do, come back tomorrow. Like when you're in a better headspace so that we can get after this. So I sent the student athlete off and I had, sent her off the field and I had my assistant go check on her and she threatened suicide and we had to get everything, you know, evaluations, ER, everything involved. And I was like, wow, this is a brand new program, division three, like there is no pressure here. This should be fun. And that I'm dealing with the things that are fun on the field. All of you get to see them in their most vulnerable states. And that's a lot. That's a big burden to take on yourselves because they're not usually coming to you for preventative, even though we want them to, and we're like, please give us preventative exercises. You're catching them when their superhuman selves that they thought they were at are vulnerable. So your work is intentional, purposeful, and I wanted to be able to give you all a few tools, maybe three or four, to take out of here that you can practice yourself and that you can model for your athletes because I don't know about any of your you know, health and commitment to yourself, but I know sometimes in the field of mental health and where I do work and with the Olympic kids and everything, everything I'm teaching, I don't practice. I'm like, no, no, I'll take care of that later. I need to take care of the kids now. So I have to pause and be like, if I want to be better, if I want them to actually internalize this, I need to model the behavior. And that was a real resounding piece. So having toolkits, to go off of when you're having those moments that you can be like, hey, why don't we try this? We've established this. Can really help you and empower you in those moments. So know yourself, right? Take the assessments. Harvard has a bias test to understand where you might be biased. And what I mean by biases is one of my biases is hard work, right? So if I don't see somebody grinding out hours, I'm like lazy. That's not true. That's not true at all, but that's a bias that I have to check at the door. 
Vaya has a good one or Via. Um, I personally like a disk assessment that comes in a card game that I'll show you guys. It's a great toolkit. Um, Enneagram, I'm an eight, friends, I'm an eight, just so everybody knows. Um, and when you take these tests, whatever phase you are in your life, like you're like, I want to take this test as an athletic trainer, as a sports medicine doctor, as a parent, as a human. Put yourself in the mindset before you sit down, eliminate distractions, and put yourself in the right space. Because your numbers and your results will be different based on different parts of your life, and I'll show you that. Um, this will also help you to know how to connect with you know, your trainers, your staff, your athletes, and how you give and receive information. It's important, nobody wants to go to, to work, school, and say, I hate my job. Or when you're in the car, you're like, I really don't wanna go there today. When you get that phone call and you're like, oh, I am not answering this. You wanna love what you're doing and share that passion. So preventing the burnout, which Tiffany went over, avoiding self-sabotage and imposter feelings. Like, why am I doing this? Am I doing this right? And also, friends, you're not that good of an actor. You can only fake it till you make it for so long. And then you get tired. And then you have that day where maybe some unfortunate kids hear what you didn't want them to hear. So taking care of yourself, understanding, learning about you. I have this card game. I got it from Liz Mason. She runs athlete assessments. It's for coaches. It's for everybody. And it's an actual physical card game where you figure out when you put yourself into your trainer, your sports medicine hat, are you a dominant personality? Are you fast and furious, direct, got to get it done? Are you an influencer, like you really need that smile? You need eye contact, you need a smile. If they're not smiling, they don't like you. If they don't like you, you failed, right? Are you more conscientious? Give me the, give me the numbers. I just need the numbers, I need the repeatability, I need the stats. Or are you more steady of like, where you're like, hmm, how can I make everyone feel included? And I'm not super expressive, I'm the calm force in the room. So you can see that if you are perhaps a steady and your student athlete is a dominant, what's that gonna be like? Or if your student athlete's an influencer and they just really need to hear what a good job they did and you're like, well, you really didn't do a good job, friend, today, but you need to hear this. How does this work so you can communicate honestly and know what you're doing in that space to get the most out of them? I do this work at different universities for different businesses where we figure out what we need to know about us to make ourselves successful and to bring out that thriving aspect. Um, and by the way, I don't work for these people. I just love their product. There is no connection. Like, I just want to make sure that that's very clear. Really important part about DISC is it identifies your personality not to change it. And it identifies the personality of the folks you work with not to change it but so that you can adapt behavior. And you can teach people how you communicate and how they need you to communicate to them. So here's a great example of what I was saying a little bit about how we can be different in different areas of life. My natural, um, <laughs> my, my natural personality is like super influencer. If you're not smiling, you don't like me. If you don't like me, I failed. Sad, right? Like zero steady. Do you see that 23 for steady? It's like, there's no calm here, folks, right? And then dominance is like moderate. This is my natural state. When I'm working with athletes, I drive that, I subconsciously drive that steady up. So you can adapt to be what you need to be in the situations. And I will tell you, when I work in an athletic department with all the coaches, I'm a hard D. That's all I am. Fast, furious directive, I don't want to hear the feedback, we're just going to get this done, which isn't the best way to be. I've had to adapt that as well. So there's something else that you can do for yourself and for your athletes or your staff. It's called a fit practice. Really important that you get a mentor if you don't have one and somebody that you can get on Zoom with or face to face maybe 30 minutes a month to make that eye contact even if it is over Zoom to say, hey, this is what I'm feeling. Is this accurate? My mentor, her name is Marlene Bjornschrud. She's an amazing woman. She was the uh, International Olympic um, recipient for women in sports in the continents of the Americas. Like, this woman has it together. And I begged her to be my mentor. And she said, no, but I'll be your thought partner. So we get on Zoom. She's out in Colorado. And to figure out where I wanted to be, why I wanted to move to Texas, what I wanted to be with my business, we did a fit practice. She had me keep a notebook in my pocket just a small little notebook, 
not a phone, like something intentional with pen and paper. And it, she said, I just want you to notice your feelings, images, and thoughts. And she did this training when she was in her 30s with a Buddhist monk from New York while she was in California. And they used to do it over the phone. So you take this and you're like, maybe you get a phone call from your boss and your instant reaction is, Ugh. like that sinking pit. So you write, boss call, sinking. Don't analyze it. Maybe your boss calls you and you're like, huzzah, this is the best day ever. Boss call, huzzah, right? You go through this. You walk outside, it's rainy, and you're like, rain, happy. You go through this practice, and you spend about a month doing it, and then at the end of the month, you look for the themes, and you start to figure out what's going to bring you joy, where you identify, what you love to do, because you're not analyzing it till the end till you have data, your own personal data that nobody else sees, and then you share that with your mentor if you choose to kind of figure out, like, this is where I need to make adjustments. This is where I feel like I'm thriving. Like Simon Sinek says, I don't know if anybody you know, uh, if you know him, leaders eat last, the golden circle, right? Knowing your why. Why do you work in training? Like if you're on a flight somewhere, or you're on the Kubota, or you're like working with athletes and they got a little bit of time, you can sit there with a little piece of paper and write the question of why do I work in training? And ask yourself that over and over and over again to get your answers. Find your themes. You'll have themes pop out, and you can be like, these are my three core values. This is why I'm doing what I love. Because once you get that and you understand those core values, you relate it to everyone around you, and you start reflecting and surrounding yourself with those folks that do that and your athletes. If your athletes know that you care, you're passionate, why you do what you're doing, they are more responsive, and they will work with you, and they will do it as well. Like my core values are authenticity, passion, and positivity. I'm going to do my best, my part in this world, to help people find their full value of who they want to be without judgment and without hesitation. So as long as I'm acting in court of that, no matter where I'm walking in the life, no matter how much an athlete is pushing back, no matter how much my boss is pushing back, if I'm there, I'm actually very happy. And that happy is modeled to the kids. That happy is modeled to your coworkers. It's extremely important to find out. And I transitioned this through a certification course. My motto for my life is the positive pursuit of excellence. And whatever that looks like for me on any given day. Some days, the positive pursuit of excellence is tying my shoe. I tied my shoes, I got out of bed. That's my positive pursuit of excellence. Some other days, I'm feeling on top of the world. Whatever it is, as long as I'm acting with authenticity, passion, and positivity, I'm doing the good work that I want for myself. So. It's important to identify your, um, your philosophy because you can identify your work environment, you can identify who should be your mentor, and you should mentor. Even if you don't think you should, start doing it. Identify assistant trainers that you like, right? Identify coaches you can partner with and identify leadership. And they should align with your philosophy. That's how you know you're in your good space. So share that vision. Again, like any time I've ever worked at an institution, with a trainer that wanted a partner, I felt so blessed. Like, we can do this together, because it takes a village, and we don't have the emotional bandwidth. So getting on that philosophy, having those talks, doing the card game with them, because you can do scenarios, and you can live action role play, which who doesn't love that? So you've created this foundation. You're implementing it. And don't worry, I want to be mindful of your time. Um, really important to get to know your athletes as people. Even if you only see them, hopefully you only get to have to see them once, right? Meaning in their whole career, maybe you see them one time and you're working through that. Take time to notice things about them. I usually keep a little notebook or something and take a note on them so I can ask them about it and follow up, right? Um, what matters to you should be evident in other people's characteristics. So even if the student athlete like, or you know, another trainer is just diametrically opposed to who you are, you can work with them, you can find something, a characteristic, a trait, an attitude that's going to keep you moving. Because you can't change people's personalities or values, but you can reward behavior. You can say, we can work together, we can get along, you can do your, you can do your sets when I'm not here, we can move forward, but you have to get them on the same page. Um, and understand that some folks will never do it. And some are really good. I, I, tell me here that you've never had a student athlete that like, was like, oh, I've done everything, and you like really believed them. And you're like, yes, they're on the path to healing. And you're like, I 
didn't do anything, right? There's sometimes they sneak in there. That's okay. Just stay clear, consistent, firm, but fair, you know, um, and then kind and caring. Now, be yourself. Set your boundaries like Tiffany taught you. Ask tough questions. Don't be afraid. And then set your expectations. So, when you build the reflection, ownership, and accountability, play the game. It's really fun to pick a person that's like a conscientious and like an influencer and be like, where do you want to go to dinner? And have them stand in front of the group. The conscientious person is like going through their head to think of all the places that are open and what's going on. And the influencer is going to be like, anywhere you want to go right now. And you can see why that would break down communication. Like, why is that so important to you? Emotional literacy, common language. Has anybody ever heard of the phrase, if you can name it, you can tame it? So I would suggest, like, you're all going to have these PDFs, like, printing out different things that mean something to you. And not from the PDF. I'm not that vain, trust me. But, like, you can search the Internet and find things that you could put all over that you can reflect upon or point to. Like, there's a reason when you go to the ER, which I was in last night. My husband got bit by a dog. Um, there was, where there's the smiley face to the frowny face, right? It's a common language. And I'm sure you have those in your training rooms. Like, where's your pain threshold? Why not have that for emotional literacy? Are you really going to get the most out of somebody if they are feeling the bottom depths of their personal life? Naming it, containing it, can give power to it. Remove the word but and replace it with and. This is hard, but I have to do it. This is hard and I have to do it. There's a difference in that powerful language. Yes, it's hard and it's going to get done. Nobody says it's going to be great and you're going to do it. There's a reason we give these words. And removal of judgment language and replace with factual. I, I, you know, I'm sorry. I'm a horrible person. I didn't, I didn't do my training. You're not a horrible person. You, made a, you chose a decision that wasn't beneficial, and you didn't do it. The fact of the matter is you didn't do the training. Okay, where do we go from here? There's no need to judge and blame and shame, right? They're their own worst, own worst critics. I take this from, it's a mood meter. It's in the front of the book. You can Google it by Mark Brackett. It's permission to feel. And you can see a low energy, high energy, and a low pleasantness, high pleasantness range. So you can have your athlete in there and say, where are you today? And guaranteed on many days, they'll be like, I'm blissful. I'm enraged. I'm drained. I'm serene. And you're like, what is going on? But that's very accurate to be in all four quadrants. If you know where they're starting, you can say, okay, so you're feeling drained. What was your sleep like? How did you eat? What, what's your pressures, right? If they're feeling, maybe they're all in the yellow and the green, and you're like, man, I want some of that, right? What did you do today to, to feel this way? What happened last night? Can we build a habit? Because then when you get them building the habits and they start coming to you and they're with you regularly, how are you feeling today? Where are we at on the chart? What, oh, so you're, you're in the blue. Did you do any of the habits that you created with yellow and green? And trust me, I know you don't have all this time with all the kids. Get your coaches to do this. Get your parents to do this. This is common language. Something else you can do. Give them a coping grounding exercise. Do this for yourself, too. Maybe you just came out of a meeting where you were like, hey, we're not going to get you that new uh, machine that you need. You don't get the stim. You don't get the TENS unit. And you have to use toilet paper instead of bandages. You're like, oh, great day, right? And now you got to walk in and work with a, an athlete. Take a minute, ground yourself. Look around the room, what are five things you can see? What are four things that you can tactile, feel, or touch? What are three things that you can hear? What are two things that you can smell and one thing that you can taste? Because this pulls you into your own skin and allows you a moment to breathe. This is great on the highway when you want to you know, give um, the thumbs down to someone that's driving, you know, that just cut you off, right? Five, four, three, two, one. And you can teach your athletes, like, if you get them working with this and maybe there's an injury on the court or on the field, you can be like, hey, I need you to ground. Five, four, three, two, one. So you can get that blood pressure down so that you can figure out what's going on when they're in a calmer state. It really, this is huge. There's also one that if you reach out to me, I'll put my phone number. I have business cards over there. You can take them. It's called Ride the Wave to get them to emotionally manage in high stress, high like world's ending situations for themselves. So identity and perspective setting. This is really important too. You should do this for yourselves. 
And then if you're working with a student athlete that is really struggling with their healing process, this is amazing. So this is an actual example. The student's name has been redacted, of course. Student was going through, had an injury, had surgery, wasn't throwing as far as they wanted to. Came to see me in my classroom last spring. Really great athlete, really doing all the workouts, but just like, I'm sure you've had those kids that are doing everything you ask and they're just not, it's not happening. Like they're not healing because they're, they're getting in their own way. So I had this student, we sat down and I said, who are you? And he's like, well, I'm an athlete, I'm a traveler, I'm a political activist, I'm an orator. These were his words, not mine. It's my terrible writing. Um, he's a mathematician. What do you love? You know, he's like, I love schoolwork, I love to work out, I love being a team player, I'm a linguist. I had him write down for about three minutes everything he thought he was and everything he loved doing. And then I circled baseball player. And I was like, that's one part of 40 things that make you amazing. And your whole day is poo and crap because you're not performing as a baseball player? Do math for me, friend. This is like a 98%. If this was English class, you'd be dancing on my desk right now. Perspective set with yourself. You have a day that you're like, well, I mean, I've had days where I'm like, let's just flush that. That was not like my day as a teacher, as an instructor, as a humanitarian. But when I think back, I'm like, breakfast was great. I got to ride to work with my husband, my kids doing well. I had one student that I didn't go well with, and then I had a great practice. I did this and this. My whole day was tanked because I put all of my self worth into one piece of who I am. You can't do that, and you can't let your kids do it either. It's really important. So language, literacy, identity, now what? Set goals for yourself. With those athletes that have longer term commitments with you, set goals with them. Set goals with your staff. Ask your boss, or if you are the boss, be like, let's make a team meeting. What do we want to accomplish? Here's my core values, what are yours? Have you even thought about it? What should be the mission? What should be written on our wall? And even if it was written last year, should it be written this year? What are we abiding by to get the best of ourselves? And put it everywhere. Poster board, mirror, doors. If you have the funds, make some t-shirts. I'm a big believer in t-shirts, right? Wear it working out. So every time somebody sees you, you're like, this is how awesome we are. So you said it, you wrote it, you need to commit to it. Have a journal even if it's a speaking journal into your phone that you delete. Have your longer term athletes, have your coaches that you're working with, right? So that you can sit down and set smart individual goals, you can set smart team and staff goals, you can do self evaluations, and you can teach folks how to get the most out of your relationship with them. Like, uh, like Ms. Barda knows that if she wants to like have a meaningful conversation with me, she's like, do you wanna go get something to eat or do you wanna sit down in your classroom? I'm like, yes. Yes, I do. She speaks my language. She's very tricky like that. She's a very good mental health counselor. Like she knows how to, to get me to do, to do what I need to do. Um, but teach people how you receive information, you know, and then self-evaluate. Sit there and look at it and be honest, especially if you're not going to share with anybody. Am I living up to what I set my goals to be? So when you're teaching them your personality, it diffuses misunderstanding. Have you ever said a word and was like, that is not the word, why are you doing that? That's, I know that's not what the word means. You're like, I have no idea what's happening right now. So diffuse misunderstanding. Encourage people to ask you directly for what they want. You might not like the answer, but at least there's no misunderstanding about what folks want, especially the kids. Like, hey, I'm here, I'm, we're working to like rehab you. What do you want out of this? What do you want from me? Because if they're like, well, I need you to answer my phone call, like every time I call, you're like, yeah, friend, that's not gonna happen. So let's set some real boundaries um, and encourage that open dialogue. Being honest, it's, it might be painful at times, but it works out better. Like a great example I have for this is like when a person will come and say, yeah, what do I need to do to get that job? What do I need to do to get that position? What do I need to do to do ABC? And, um, and you hear people say, well, if you do this, this, and this, and then they don't meet the goal. And they're like, but you said, and the failure was on the person asking the question because they didn't say, you need to do A, B, and C, and even then, somebody else might be working harder. Somebody else might fit the billet better. 
So work hard because you want to. I'm being honest, this is what you need to do, but it still might not, you might not achieve the goal that you thought you wanted. And sometimes that's a blessing. Sometimes we don't get things that we shouldn't have. So meet people where they're at, invest in them as people, build trust, create a safe and welcoming environment. Like if you're in a room where somebody's gonna sit on the other side of the desk from you at all times when they come in to chat, do you think that creates a good communication flow? Or does that assert someone being in a dominant position? And then when you need to be in a dominant position, maybe you're in charge and you're like, we have to have a talk. Maybe you do, but I'll tell you what, getting on the other side of your desk, getting down to the level, like if a kid is sitting on a table, like sitting in the chair instead of standing, like getting eye level and making in purposeful, intentional connection, it is going to show them you invest in them as people and they will start responding accordingly in terms of what's best for them and for the relationship. So once you do all this, you want to maintain your environment, you want your eagles in the locker room. These are the folks that you work with that will tell you the hard stuff that nobody wants to tell you. Like, hey, we just got out of that meeting and no one liked that idea. And you're like, I appreciate you telling me that. Tell me why, tell me more about that. Or, hey, so-and-so's parent passed. Did you know that? Maybe they shouldn't be here. Like, you need those people, and you need to have that trust and that communication and that emotional literacy with folks so that you can be the best you can working with others. Gather your input, get creative, make fun-tivity days, LARP it out. I'm a huge fan of live action role play because it's really hilarious. And you get out of your skin and you get to be whoever you want to be. Um, no, I don't do cosplay. I'm just talking with personalities and things like that. Um, know when to be flexible while maintaining your values. If there's wiggle room and you're still keeping your values, do it. And reevaluate often and listen. And just because something was a rule today doesn't mean it has to be a rule tomorrow. If it turns out things are changing. I mean, COVID, if that didn't teach us like that everything is able to be changed and there's only an illusion of control in our world, then I don't know what did. So it starts with you and it ends with you. Always read, always learn, get a mentor, be a mentor. Network, you're here, brilliant, good job. Take all the phone numbers, create group chats, send emails. Make those purposeful connections to your colleagues, ask questions, like if you have the question, guaranteed other folks in the room have it, be brave. Ask the question. Run a disc assessment, I think they're fun, I take them all the time. They're regularly the same. And get as much education as you can. So make sure that you're managing your passion, find your balance, use all those tips that Tiff gave you, continue to educate, being flexible, listen to yourself, be your best friend. Be your own best friend first. You are the person that was born with you, you are the person that ends this life with you. Be yourself, be true to you. Because then your athletes will do it and it will be a beautiful, a beautiful connection. So thank you, and do you have any questions? There's my information if you need it. I think you should all get up and kind of move around a little bit. You've been sitting for a long time. I always give like a two minute break and I'm totally like commandeering this meeting. Just stand up and move if you need to.